um, without much further ado, I'm going to pass you on to the first speaker this evening. Our first speaker tonight is Robert Logan. Robert is the Co-op Development Manager at SAOS, Scotland's umbrella body for agricultural cooperatives. He has a particular interest in the livestock sector and in rural business management. Robert has a farming background and 15 years producer extension and consultancy experience, having most recently been a senior livestock business consultant at SAC Consulting. Now with SAOS, Robert specialises in direct support to, to their members, and as part of a the team, their purpose is to strengthen the profitability, competitiveness and sustainability of Scotland's farming and food cooperatives. He supports members through governance services, training, development work, as well as an important advocacy role across the industry. Outside of work, Robert proudly spends most of his time with his wife and two children, extended family and friends, and he enjoys walking, cycling, and sports, mostly watching, but also including being a local volunteer mini rugby coach. Robert. Thanks, Kerry. Good evening, all. Um, hopefully everyone's had a chance to play back some of the gems of information um, on cooperation that has been over the past uh, two webinars. If not, I you know, definitely encourage you to, to, to do so, to revisit those. Uh, and this is the, you know, the last of the webinars, and, and we've got some leading uh, examples of co-ops here in Scotland, but I want over the next 15 minutes or so, um, if we broaden our horizons and, and it looks slightly further afield, I want to do this just to highlight the global importance of the co-op business model, so it's not just something that's quite local or quite niche, um, and shine a light on their ambitions and success they've had and the scale that they've got to as co-ops. Uh, and what we could potentially achieve here in Scotland, but also how the uh, co-op model could be an appropriate structure uh, for some alternative ideas in the not too distant future as well. Uh, next slide, please, Seamus. Right, uh, we don't fly the flag enough, possibly, for, for um, you know, the, 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 the co-op model. Um, you know, and, uh, Collectively, turnover of members is about one and a half billion, um, and that's benefiting you know, about 25,000 members. And that's covering the full gamut of farmers from soft fruit to seafood, venison uh, to potatoes, uh, pigs to timber. It's all really exciting stuff. Um, and, and we don't probably fly that flag enough. And I just want to kind of highlight it here. And possibly just as a wee pot of summary, just to remind ourselves of a slightly different audience from, from the previous two webinars. Cooperation is about, it's in its simplest form, is simply about people getting together, working together to achieve a shared goal. And it's something that they couldn't or, um, necessarily achieve individually. And in farmers' case, those individuals that are coming together are actually made up of lots of different farming businesses, and they'll be sole traders, partnerships, and limited companies. But ultimately, they come together to share resource skills, scale, to achieve something more than themselves. And, and whilst uh, retaining, you know, there's another important point, you know, co-ops tend to, you know, if they're based in the rural area, that's retaining um, high value skills and employment in, in the local area for, for the members as well. And next slide, please. Um, now, so basically a co-op can be what your group needs it to be, a, a community food group or a multinational. But before we go into a few examples, uh, let's use this uh, simple analogy uh, here. Now, a farm um, with one hectare of deep peat, no matter how, what the conservation value of that deep peat is, for instance, uh, that's excellent, but you're probably not getting MD's attention. If you get a group of farmers that have collected a 100 hectares of deep peat, 1,000 hectares of deep peat. Now you've got a proposition, yeah? And now everybody is an equal part of that solution or of, 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 for a customer's solution. Now, if you replace deep peat with any other farm input, service or output, um, you know, you can see the, start to see the value in cooperation, whether it's formal or informal cooperation, doesn't matter. Now each hectare, each business is an equal part of the solution. And that's also a changes the type of conversation with government stakeholders and customers. Yeah. Next slide, please. 
Now here, um, what I want to do, if we get our eye in slightly, um, this is the most recent uh, list um, of the top 300 co-ops around the world by scale, by turnover. Um, the number of producer co-ops is particularly interesting. So the first, the, 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 the second, uh, the left-hand side uh, image will show you that, that those co-ops and their breakdown. Now there's 104 producer co-ops. Now that's huge when you think of the scale we're talking about, you know, producer co-ops, when you think they're in the mix along with yeah, insurance mutuals and banks and retail cooperatives. Yeah. And if you look at the right-hand side uh, image, you'll see the, the spread of, of, of co-ops across the world. Now, they're on, they're on every continent and massive co-ops. We're not seeing anything registered in Africa. They're huge in Africa as well. We're just because we're looking at the top 300 by turnover by US dollars. Yeah. And the particularly interesting thing here with the um, with with this particular um, uh, image as map is it the number of co-ops that are in Europe and particularly Northern Europe um, and in America is and particularly the United States seventy four is co-ops are essential and are a massive part of rural America and we'll come back to that in in uh, a little bit later. Um, now, there are three countries where over half the population I have co-op members, uh, are, you know, are co-op members, as you say, and, and they're all in Europe. Um, we've got Ireland, Finland, uh, Austria, and France. Co-ops handle 60% of all retail banking, 40% of, of food and uh, agri-production, uh, and 25% and of retail sales. This is big business. Um, in New Zealand, uh, 22 a percent by gross domestic and GDP um, is generated through co-ops um, and are responsible for 95% of uh, the dairy market and 95% of, of, of uh, dairy exports. Yeah. Hugely export focused and that's a completely different dynamic again when, when you've got to, to be competitive, get your messaging right and, and, um, and compete in you know, international markets. Next slide, please, Jonas. Um, hey, let's get our eye in here to, to this um, chart. We've got total uh, turnover along the bottom and by, by selected European country along, along the side. Now you'll see the red bar there is co-op turnover, yeah, total co-op turnover by country. And the blue bar is the agricultural um, you know, an industry output. Now, every one of those selected countries, bar the United Kingdom, um, sees their, their, their co-op turnover is greater uh, than, than their agri uh, turnover. And that's simply because that they've, um, they're vertically integrated over time to try and grab additional margin. That's primarily why that's there. In the UK, we've not done that. Um, but we, we have elsewhere, and I'm going to come to a few particular examples um, in, in just a little moment. But it's a significant difference, and it just shows the strength of some of the co-ops um, elsewhere. Next slide, please. Yep. Now, I've picked out a few examples from elsewhere in the world, some large and some smaller, but either way, the message here is less about the scale, but about how each co-op um, has been effective in serving its purpose for its members. You know? And while serving different sectors, they hold something very important in common. Their members recognise the need to take control of a situation, um, either in correcting a market failure or taking on an opportunity. Uh, and they've showed that can do attitude, and that's you see that's common across co-ops. Um, they know it couldn't be done alone, but they have the ambition and they want it to be achieve something to be part of that bigger solution. These are important qualities that shouldn't be forgotten. Now, if you want to talk about scale, uh, we could have, have mentioned the top left-hand corner there, uh, the dairy industry. We could have mentioned Dairy Farmers of America. Um, I'm, I'm reading some of these stats because I couldn't remember them all, but it's huge, huge figures. Uh, 28 billion litres um, um, throughput. There's thirty percent of the U.S. production turnover is about seventeen, nearly eighteen billion uh, American dollars, twelve billion pounds, uh, and that represents about thirteen thousand members. Huge, huge scale. 
um, the largest uh, producer co-op in America, indeed one of the largest in the world. Now, and we shouldn't forget Arla as well. Um, Arla in, in, in Europe, they've got 11 billion, billion euro turnover and managing over 13 billion litres of raw milk into you know, high value produce now and, and brand names. A highly effective and very competitive here in, in the UK as well. But for this particular example, I wanted to, to flag a Agricor, something that's, um, you know, if you get a chance, go to their website, hopefully it'll come in the chat just shortly. Um, there's one who very explicitly um, 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 recognise and highlight that they're, they're a cooperative and they use it at a USP as well. Now they're based in Quebec in Canada. They process about 6 billion litres of raw milk. They're not dissimilar in type uh, to Arla, um, but they've got a turnover there of about 7.5 uh, billion Canadian uh, dollars for the 3,000 members. Um, they're, they're slightly different. There's two, two things. One, one, I wanted to flag up the fact that they're, they're very explicitly in use as a USP, the fact that they're a co-op. But secondly, the other part of it is that they've managed to unlock the American market. They've gone beyond their boundaries, if you like. And so whilst in Canada, they've got some recognised and high value brand names, whereas business to consumer, effectively, a, to, to unlock the American market the, through a series of strategic acquisitions, they've got a, you know, it's business to business type joint ventures. And, and in doing so, that's actually you know, they've, they've, they've great success in the US now as well, but that's also unlocked some the opportunities in Europe and Asia too, um, which just, just shows that ambition and, and there's different ways of doing things within a co op. Um, and I thought that's a particularly good one to, to highlight. Um, another one is uh, Alcorn uh, Clean Fuels. So it's an, it's an example of a group of growers who combine to invest in growing of corn or energy maize effectively for um, bioethanol for fuel. And now they're working. Co uh, cooperatively, largely in the US Midwest, uh, Minnesota, producing uh, some kind of half a million, uh, 500 million litres, I should say, of ethanol. Now, to get my head around that, that's about 250 lorries of grain going into the plant uh, per day at peak. Uh, so, a massive business. And, you know, it remains a co op on, on, on many others, but that's at least partly due to the entrepreneurship and the, the, that vision of the founding members um, been established 30 years ago, whereas the real US ethanol boom didn't really start for, until about 20 years ago. So the scale didn't happen overnight, but that sheer vision and have just you know, carried that forward. I thought it was one to, to, to highlight. And that's rural America, as I said before, you know, um, well, it's energy co-ops um, and, and, and these co-ops. Um, the, these are huge parts of, of what makes rural America tick. Um, yeah, to the top right hand side, we've got Alliance Group in New Zealand. You know, they're worth highlighting from the red meat sector. Alliance are massive, 100% farmer controlled, and again, very, very successful, um, representing 4,500 members, a turnover of 1.5 billion uh, New Zealand dollars, which is you know, three quarter, um, you know, three quarters of a billion uh, pounds, uh, selling 95% uh, of that is international trade, of course, as well, which makes them have to think quite laterally, quite different uh, in order to make those sales and they need to be very lean, very competitive. But yet they're doing that successfully for lamb, for mutton, for beef, for venison, and now co-products as well. It's not the flashy end of sales, um, but but co-products is something, you know, that's, that's where you need to get the, the innovation in there and get the right partners involved. So that's where you get the incremental margin that it's driven back to members. Another one I'll touch upon slightly is one of the, of, of, of many um, olive oil um, growers, the uh, cooperatives, uh, Andalusia in Spain. It's now one of the largest co-ops in Spain that are, we're showing there just now, 8,000 members, and that's about 30,000 hectares. Absolutely huge, but they're doing some, I raise it here because it's, it's slightly different. It's a value add product, but they're also doing something really in, interesting. They're doing some really interesting stuff eh, and innovation um, and, and coordinating efforts of these thousands of small growers. Um, so, and whilst it's an area that's recognized for high quality olive oil production, that's no automatic route to continued success. We have plenty of substitutes, plenty of other options. Um, and to, you know, maintain, keep relevant, I suppose, 
they, 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 they need to make sure they're competitive, but also they're, they're, they're being efic efficient as possible and they're looking at innovation all the time. Um, some of those innovations are, are about improved efficiency, but some are about reducing water use, and, and that which benefits the community as well. Uh, but also, and this is probably quite an interesting example of where co-ops can, can really coordinate effort when it comes to knowledge transfer and exchange, uh, helping embrace change more quickly as, as the growers are actually connected to the benefit, they can see the benefit because it's actually they're part of the, the company, they're part of the, the co-op, they're part of that structure. Um, they are the members, they are the shareholding members. Um, and that and that just drives, if they can do that more quickly than anybody else, and that just drives value into them, down to the member more quickly. Okay, next slide, please, Jim. In this slide, I'm highlighting a few slightly different co-ops, and I think these are something for the future. So whilst the, the, the previous ones are, are um, highly successful um, and will be for a long time, equally, um, it's, it's, it's all about you know, commodity trading. Uh, here I'm highlighting um, an environmental co-op uh, in the top left-hand corner, uh, Born in Nature, uh, if I've pronounced it right. Um, anyway, yeah, that's a Dutch-based environmental co-op, and they manage the relationship between a uh, farmer and the government as far as when it comes to the payments of agri-environment schemes, you know, and effectively, you know, an industry-driven coordinated body, but they themselves are owned by 40 provincial nature co-ops, um, and that, com that combination creates national coverage. These collectives, as they're, as they're called, these regional co-ops, manage the actual implementation of the agri-environment schemes at a local level, at a farm level. And it's a truly, it's a more innovative approach, led, less, you know, um, assessor and us, it's, it's, it's more of a partnership. And they're doing that for 11,000 farmers, and that's 110,000 hectares. Big, big scale, it's something slightly different. It's not something that's happening at scale uh, here, but it's certainly something for the future not in order to try and coordinate um, our natural capital uh, and, and um, some you should look at more, more carefully. Uh, and the big advantage, again, a bit like um, we we're talking about with olive oil, a uh, big advantage over a centralised method is that it's, it's industry driven. The connection and the ownership of that group of the farmers and their delivery uh, means you know, that everybody gets the benefit of that because everybody can see the benefit. And that's reciprocal benefit for the taxpayer, for the government, and everybody else. Hey, another one actually is the uh, Agricon, which is a new co-op just made up of, of three previous uh, genetics co-ops uh, in, in Europe. Now that it's a genetics co-op, and there, but that covers a membership of 53,000 farmers in Germany, France, Denmark, Finland, Sweden. Um, a massive coverage, and it's a massive part of the European Dairy Herdbook. Um, one of them was um, Evolution, another one was uh, Viking Genetics, uh, who you may have, have heard of. But again, you know, that's, that's a big example um, that is a, a cooperative, but again, it doesn't actually need to be, it just, it, um, just needs to be a series of like-minded readers with, with a good business plan. A top right-hand corner um, about, is one about data. Now, data, George will speak more about tech and data, so I won't go into any detail, but like genetics, this is something for the future, potentially, something to be thinking about. Uh, it's a relatively new opportunity, um, but if we think more largely about what is on-farm, what is value, and how do we add value to the farm, and data is increasing uh, we're, we're collecting an increasing amount of data, um, so I thought I would I would mention certainly a good friend of SCOS, uh, Billy Tiller, um, the Grower um, Information Services Cooperative (GISC) in Texas, uh, and that's one of the first um, co-ops to represent growers' interests in the, in the in the area of data and information, and uh, he's built an international uh, well, it's a national co-op. Um, with members in, in uh, over 40 states, uh, of, and it's covering all major, major commodities. Uh, an idea being that an increased amount of data has been requested by customers downstream, uh, but producers are not set up to organise and gather that data to gain the best insight themselves, 
to benefit from their own business and sharing the value, that value uh, and that efficiency, but also to open up new opportunities um, with, the, with our collective data. I'll not go into any detail with Danish Agro, but it's an interesting model, again, absolutely huge. Um, there are hybrid inputs, services and marketing co-op selling everything from the seed to the grain on behalf of their members, including livestock feeding, and massive throughout, throughout um, Northern, Northern Europe. Um, and there's plenty of others as well. I mean, we've got in the, in the bottom there, we'll see those, you know, those, for the future, those energy, energy crops, rural finance, that's how Rebel Bank started. Um, pharma, potentially, in, in, in the future, uh, extracting of nutrients from existing crops for the benefit of pharmaceuticals. Um, timber, uh, novel crops mentioned, regional food tourism. There's lots of opportunities where, where existing businesses can uh, co collate around an idea uh, and, and potentially form a co-op, um, if that's appropriate to, for, for, for greater, for greater um, benefit. Um, maybe the last slide, please, James. Yep, so I suppose the kind of point uh, of any of these examples is to demonstrate what is possible. Um, the co-ops can be what members need them to be, from local craft to, to you know, a craft co-op to a multinational. Um, and it's no one co-op is likely to um, provide all the solutions, but if, every co-op will have you know, potentially can, can, can have some sort of level of impact and benefit to the business. So it's, a, it's, that, it's that makeup of how these different co-ops need um, align with your own needs and, and how being part of that makes your business better and bigger and they're actually an extension of your business in effect. because that allows you then to um, afford the skills, the specialist skills, uh, to be able to tap into a, you know, a, a market or marketing that you couldn't do yourself. Uh, or simply, we need first a good business plan, uh, then we need to see if the co-op model is appropriate, but ultimately it comes down to creating a fair and transparent structure that ensures everyone who participates, I suppose, uh, shares equally in its advantage. And that's that fairness, it's, it's a massive part of it. Um, but there's, it's not, it used to be just about collect, collecting together to get the scale for marketing, but now it's about making life easier, you know, um, the transactions, and reducing administration, but reducing risk as well and volatility, markets are more volatile. I've uh, been part of some bigger allows you to kind of shield from some of that risk. Knowledge transfer and exchange, data management, being part of something bigger, a bigger ambition as well. So it's not all just about values, not all just money, not, not, not directly any necessarily. Um, but yeah, it, so there's, there's always big challenges, I think. Um, but the biggest challenge is giving yourself thinking space in a busy farming business to share those ideas, to think more laterally and then grasp the opportunities and be part of some to get be part of something to, to afford them the energy and something else. It's not just a family, family business um, directly um, in order to, 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 to grasp some of these additional opportunities rather than just trying to work harder uh, to, uh, to make, make ends meet. Uh, so I suppose I'd finish by saying that providing scale and negotiation, you know, again, was, was primarily the reason, but now we're looking at risk management, data and knowledge exchange. You know, that's all really, really important stuff that can all be done through a co-op. Uh, and there's scope within the UK and exciting opportunities in there. I like data and genetics and nature. And it's not, so it's not just existing commodities, um, which, which there's scope for as, as well. There's all these other angles now as well, like the novel crops, and niche crops, and pharma we mentioned before as well. Yeah, and I said one, one co-op is not necessarily going to provide the full answer, but it's how that, that makeup of all of being part of lots of different co-ops will all have different levels of impact and importance on your business. Yeah, but hopefully these examples yeah, from these different countries yeah, can we can relate to some of that important you know, these countries we can relate to, and we can relate to the the scale and the potential then eh, of, of what has been achieved elsewhere. And I hope that's of, hope that's of interest. Eh, with that, I will hand back to Kerry. Thank you very much, Robert. That was uh, absolutely fantastic. I think it was really 
positive to hear about all those opportunities, the things that are happening that people might not be aware of. And for me, it certainly gave me a desire to get back out and travel again, go and see what they're doing. Um, for our viewers, uh, Robert's email address is in the chat. The SAOS website is in the chat, along with a couple of links that Robert wanted to share with you, examples of uh, a producer co-op, and we uh, uh, we also have a couple of other links there. Um, a question was asked uh, during the presentation about resources. So just so you know, the slides, the recording of this webinar and all of the speakers resources will be uploaded to the Farm Advisory Service website. So um, next up this evening, we are very lucky to be joined by TJ Flanagan. So TJ Flanagan is the CEO of ICOS, which is the Irish Cooperative Organization Society. It represents directly and indirectly over 300 cooperatives in the Republic of Ireland, ranging in size from tiny group water schemes, community and Gaeltic co-ops, to large dairy purchasing, processing and export co-ops with individual turnovers in the billions of euros. He notes that whilst co-ops are reasonably well developed in the agricultural and rural economy, the co-op model is sadly underdeveloped in urban Ireland. ICOS is a small organisation with 15 staff. ICOS concentrates on three key service areas. Firstly, policy development and representation. Secondly, rules, legal and governance. And finally, three, learning and development. TJ is an, agricult TJ is an agricultural science graduate with a, professional, with a professional diploma in corporate governance. He's worked for ICOS for 21 years and has been CEO for five of them. Prior to appointment as CEO, he worked in areas such as livestock marts, animal health and dairy policy. His single biggest focus is the importance of growing the capacity of ordinary farmer members to become good leaders of large, complex, competitive businesses. When he left university, he worked for six years as an agronomist for Ireland's largest oat milling company. He lives in County Tipperary. In his spare time, he's a huge Munster rugby fan and does a bit of boating in Ireland's inland waterways. TJ, I'll pass over to you. Thanks, Kerry. Um, thanks, Seamus, for putting up those slides. Um, I just want to, first of all, thank you for the invitation to speak here this evening. Um, I guess I was asked to give a flavour of what the cooperative movement has done or what it has achieved in, in, in Ireland. Uh, and I, 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 what I want to share with you is just some of our experience and what has worked and what hasn't worked and maybe why things have worked and why things haven't worked. Um, I guess, first of all, just to explain yeah, ICOS, uh, the Irish Cooperative Organisation Society, uh, we used to be known up until about 50 years ago as the IAOS, the Irish Agricultural Organisation Society. So our roots are showing, you can see that we are a very close relation of uh, the SAOS and we had a very similar name until about 50 years ago when one of my predecessors decided to change uh, an A for a C. Um, just so you understand, as I mentioned, there's, a, there's about a thousand co-ops in Ireland. Um, out of about 250,000 corporate entities. So co-op is very much a niche. Uh, it's a speciality. And as, as Kerry said, it has got most traction in agriculture and, and disappointingly not as much traction in other areas. Uh, the co-op movement has its roots in the late 1890s, uh, sorry, the late 1880s, early 1890s, uh, when I guess it got traction in a lot of countries. Uh, and you know it grew very quickly for a few years as, as co-ops and in the, at that stage there were small tiny little crossroads dairy cooperatives but as they started to spread around the country uh, dramatic expansion for the first few decades and then I guess we had political turmoil and we had the first world war and we had a war of independence and then we had a civil war and then we had an economic war with Britain and we had all sorts of shenanigans so the, 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 the cooperative movements suffered for several decades but certainly since we I really joined the EEC and our agriculture started to get more organized. Uh, the sector started to become progressive again. Um, Seamus, you might just move on to the next slide there. And I'll just give a little, yeah, the next one again, just um, 
give you a flavor for what agriculture in, in, in Ireland and the Republic of Ireland looks like, which is the 26 counties as opposed to six counties in the north. Um, so ROI, we're a little bit smaller than Scotland. We have about 7 million hectares in total. Um, about, I guess if you look at the map down there, you'll see agriculture really here, just like in Scotland, is largely influenced by the amount of rain we get. Uh, and those areas that get a hell of a lot of rain, their agriculture is, you know, that determines the type of agriculture. So it's, 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 it's sheep farming and it's heavy ground farming. Um, so about 10% of our total land area is used for forestry, and that's mostly dominated by the state forestry company, some private forestry, which we have some cooperatives involved with. About 64% of the land is used for agriculture, and of that, the vast majority is grass. So we're a, a grass grazing economy. Only about 10% of our, our, our arable land is actually uh, set down to crop production. About 100,000 farms, or what you could call farms, I think there's about 120,000 uh, holdings are registered for basic payments, but um, about 100,000 really are what you call farms, uh, averaging around 48, 40 hectares each. Um, of that 100,000, about 30,000 are what you call full-time commercial. Um, and of those, about 16 or 17,000 are dairy farmers. So the, the rest are probably semi-retired, part-time, off-farm incomes, lots of mix and gather them type operations. But there's about 30,000 are depending full-time for agriculture for their living commercial businesses. And on the right-hand side there, you can just see the range in incomes that, that, that people derive from farming. So the stats, Chagas, which is our, our National Agricultural Development Authority, uh, they do farm um, surveys every year. And the, the 2020 survey results were published, I think, only last week. And you can see from the top the average dairy farm, which uh, has of the people they surveyed had an average farm size of 60 hectares, uh, average farm income of 74 and a half thousand odd. Uh, cattle rearing, which is mostly suckler, suckler farming, average holding 30 hectares odd, 9,000 euros of winning. So you can see very much a, a, a part-time operation. Cattle other is a, is, is contains those farmers that are, those beef will say farmers that aren't in, don't have suckler herds. Slightly bigger, 37 hectares, but the income's 14,000. Um, obviously, there's a huge rage within that, and there are quite big beef operations who are making reasonable incomes. But um, sheep farms average 44 hectares. A lot of it is mountain land, 18,000 euros. Tillage, slightly bigger, 62 hectares, 32,000 odd. Uh, and the national average farm income is 25,000 euros. So uh, within that, there's a huge range, but you can see the dairy sector is really the only sector that can guarantee a sustainable income uh, with any kind of a holding size. So you can see then why, as I'll explain later, you know, dairy is the sector, sort of where it's all at, you know. Uh, just for what, what a co-op is, I'm sure it's pretty much the same thing in Scotland, but, you know, what is a co-op as we recognise it? It's a, it's a corporate, it's an, incorp it's an incorporated entity. So, you know, it benefits from protection from creditors, limited liability. Uh, it's not a company, though. Companies are registered under our company's legislation. Our co-ops, about a thousand of them, are registered under an ancient piece of legislation that we inherited from Westminster when we were part of, of the UK. So the IPS Act 1893 and its successor legislation, we're still sort of dealing with that. We're about to get a new co-op act, but as of now, we still have that ancient piece of legislation. They're democratic structures owned and controlled by the members for the benefit of the members, and they're governed by unlike a constitution, I guess, which you have in a, in a company or a memorandum and articles of association, we have a rule book. And for our co-op members, they have an ICAS rule book. So we have a veto on amendments to the rule book, et cetera. But their body corporates, like any other, they just have a deeply democratic structure, which has upsides and it has downsides. Okay, Kerry. So just so you understand, I guess, where our co-ops are, what they, what you know, what business they're at. Dairy dominates the co-op uh, sector within Ireland. There's about 20 societies, or 20 dairy societies, really, in business. But nine of them are actually processing. So when we say processing, they're actually evaporating and drying milk. Uh, about seven, some of those are already are processing as well, and others are, are non-processors who pack liquid milk for the domestic market. Uh, those co-ops would have supplier numbers ranging from about 40 to about 4,500 uh, of milk suppliers. 
the average milk supply in Ireland is about 500,000 500, litres, sort of 80 cow operation. So that's the range and scale. So that from the really tiny, really local to the quite, quite big and quite evolved. Uh, between them, they process about eight and a half billion litres of milk in the Republic of Ireland, plus about 800 million uh, that they bring over the border from Northern Ireland. Plus they process about another 800 million in Northern Ireland uh, in plants that they own in Northern Ireland. So they're quite big operators and they process a lot of milk. And, and within the Republic of Ireland, the co-ops are, are companies owned by the co-ops process 95 or 6% of the milk. So, you know, they dominate the milk sector. And those co-ops include what we call Ornua, uh, which is what's formerly the Irish Dairy Board, which is the largest export arm for uh, dairy products uh, off the island. So, uh, you know, a two and a half billion euro, three billion euro company as well. So between them all, they total turnover. Well, if you added all their turnovers, they come to substantially more than five billion. But between them, they handle about five billion euros worth of dairy product. Um, most of them are also multi-purpose co-ops, but they're also very active in agri-trading. There's other bits and pieces, but they're quite dominant in agri-trading. So they buy about 60% of the grain in the country uh, and they manufacture about over 60% of the ruminant feed. So they are they have quite a big footprint in, in agri-trading as well. Um, so there isn't actually much by way of grain co-ops in the Republic of Ireland. The, the, the grain is bought by co-ops, which happen to be principally dairy co-ops. Uh, it's your the next one, Kerry. Uh, the next, I suppose, biggest sector would be the livestock mart sector, which are auction marts, just like you have in Scotland. There's about 80 of those nationally, but about, about half of those are actually co-op owned, and the co-ops are the bigger ones. Um, they would turn over about a billion euros, uh, and they'd sell about a million cattle and half a million sheep. So it's a, a sector that evolved from the 50s onwards as as auction technology emerged and very traditional businesses and and up until a few months ago they would never have dreamt of selling cattle online you couldn't do that no people want to be there to buy the cattle and next thing COVID comes along the ultimate disruptor and now they all have very very good well-developed offerings of online um, buying and selling of, of, of cattle uh, and since the marts have opened up again post-COVID they're sticking very firmly to the blended model of buyers buying in the ring and buyers buying online and uh, everybody's delighted except the dealers who can no longer bully their way around the ring because they don't know who they're competing against because there's somebody on a laptop. So it's been a hugely positive development actually for, for Marks in Ireland. And carry the next one there. Yeah, also I guess well-developed, our crops are well-developed in livestock breeding sector. So we have, um, three large AI, either co-ops or companies owned by co-ops, uh, cattle breeding and on the dairy or the, or the beef side. Breed societies, whether it's cattle, sheep or horse, uh, the vast majority are co-ops. Um, and we have ICBF, which is the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation, which is kind of the umbrella body for everything got to do with cattle breeding. That's a co-op as well, a co-op of co-ops, and they have an ICAS rule book. So, you know, Anything really in the livestock sector is dominated by the, the co-op model, the co-op structure. Next slide, Kerry. Um, but farm services as well are very well involved it, with the co-op model. So we have the, the farm relief service, which is a kind of a federal structure of lots of, well, it was originally lots of small regional co-op farm relief services. Uh, and uh, lots of those have merged. So we've actually won national big one with a couple of satellites, but they're all co-ops and they provide specialized labor services and recruitment services and uh, principally for farmers, but they've got into fencing and lots of other things as well. And, you know, the freeze branding and all those other services that specialized services that farmers require, as well as relief milking. And um, my first my own first job was working as a as a as a, an operative for mid Tipperary farm relief services. And as I constantly remind them, I never won employee of the month. So um, probably as well that I left them. Uh, we have two farm accounts co-ops, which probably between them do certainly the vast majority of the farm accounts business for, we say, for commercial farmers. Uh, each one would probably have about 20,000 um, clients, farm clients. Um, started out 40 years, 50 years ago, just um, 
doing very simple recording of records uh, before probably tax tax system as well developed. And now they're very sophisticated farm accounts business um, and, and, and one of them is an audit firm as well. So they're co-ops and milk recording is, is um, dominated or principally carried out by three co-ops as well. So very dominant in that sector. Uh, and then other rural co-ops, as Kerry mentioned earlier, we have what we call group water schemes. I don't know whether they exist in Scotland, but in Ireland, the, in, in the rural areas, um, either you have your own well or you have um, water provided by the, the, the county councils, which was probably the minority, uh, or you join a group water scheme. So we have about 300 of those um, which provide water for anything between 20 houses and probably 1,000 houses. And they're co-ops, the vast majority of them are co-ops, uh, providing a local service and doing it very efficiently, clean water to their customers. Forestry, I mentioned earlier, we forestry in Ireland is dominated by the Quilche, which is a state forest company, but we've increasingly more uh, private plantations where farmers have planted a bit of their land or a bit of hilly ground. Our investors have bought bits of mountains and planted them with Sitka spruce. But most private forestation, forestry plantations are sort of 10 hectares and less. They're not, they're not at the scale whereby you could carry out cleaning operations or marketing of your timber. So they have most of those, or a lot of those people have joined into co-ops, newly established forestry co-ops, procure the services they need or ultimately to sell their timber. Fisheries, we have fisheries co-ops and POs, producer organizations, which are co-ops themselves. They'd be more successful in the shellfish area than in the, than in the hunted species, but uh, we have a number of them. And we have three mushroom co-ops as well, which, uh, and they're registered as POs under European law as well. So the model is very flexible. The next one. And then we have new co-ops growing. Energy is an area everybody's interested in. Number of our existing co-ops invested in wind energy back through the years. Uh, and then we have new ones wanting to start to community co-ops wanting to start afresh in either wind energy, but now it's actually solar. Solar is the biggest game in town. So we have lots of groups establishing now want to set up as community uh, community owned wind or solar generation entities in Ireland. I don't know how it works in the UK, but there's there's preferential access to the grid, the community owned electricity generation sustainable electricity generation entity. So everybody wants to set up a solar energy co-op. Uh, and that's for, you know, um, a solar array of 10 hectares or 20 hectares or whatever. But the new area is where we bring together um, lots of small generators. So the, the current plan is that we put small arrays on, on the roof of every milking parlor and that the co-op, the existing co-op, would combine all the, the their members who happen to have solar arrays on their milking parlors or their cattle sheds and we have a, a virtual electricity generation network with preferential access to the grid for their surplus power. Uh, carbon farming is a new area. Um, we've had a couple of co-ops set up on that. So there are groups wanting to either buy or, or, or lease or manage land uh, with a view to ultimately selling some sort of carbon credits, which will be verified to, I don't know, an airline or a retailer or somebody who wants to be able to say that their operations are, are, are offset somewhere. Uh, lots of community development co-ops, and as Kerry said, depth of co-ops, so small rural community co-ops providing services. Uh, and now the, all the hipsters, of course, are now getting involved in, they like the, the concept of co-ops, so there's lots of inquiries around new media and areas like that. We don't ultimately know whether we'll get traction there, but we're dealing with a lot of requests in that area. Okay, Kerry. Um, I guess... Actually, one other area I should have mentioned was, uh, I know it's, it's a big thing for SAOS, which is machinery rigs. We've always, I guess, looked over the hedge very, very uh, um, enviously of, of, of how well established the machinery ring sector was in Scotland. But we've quite recently set up our first machinery ring in the Republic of Ireland. Um, and it's got seven members because that's what you need to set up a co-op in Ireland. So we have one machinery ring with seven members. And as of now, the entire extent of their, their operations is one low emissions uh, slurry spreading tanker, a big, big tanker um, trading shoe slurry tanker. They came together as a co-op to manage that. So, But we've great ambitions to spread the model and we're using the French Kuma model of machinery ring co-op. There's just a slide just in relation to the dairy sector. 
really just to explain to you why dairy is so dominant maybe in our co-op model it's because dairy has become dominant in Irish agriculture dairy was reasonably small historically sort of three billion liters uh, we grew very strongly after joining the EEC and we almost doubled production to about five and a half billion liters um, because of increasing prices etc and then when the quotas came in we a lot of people got caught quite badly because we had some brucellosis issues and herds were depopulated. So we really stagnated for, for 30 years, 25 years anyway, just no growth and, and it's a terrible environment really for any business. But then when quotas were to be ended in 2015 and in the lead up to it, you know, as I said earlier, dairy is the only show in town from the viewpoint of having um, economic far opportunities for a reasonable sized farm. So farmers just embraced dairy and converted to dairy. So we've had a, the national target was, a, was for a 50% increase on our 2008-2009 milk volume by 2020. Um, we've, we've had an over 60% increase. Uh, and actually, if you look at it in milk solids terms, because we're not interested in water, uh, water has to be flashed off, steamed off. We're interested in milk solids. We've probably had 70% increase in milk solids since um, the reference period. So that's, that's where we are. It's milk is dominating you know, commercial agriculture. Next slide there, Kerry. And, and again, that's just, just shows you the growth in milk supply over the last number of years. That's, it also shows you our seasonality. We have a highly seasonal milk production industry uh, where the, only about 6% of our milk is actually produced for domestic liquid milk consumption for putting on your cornflakes. Uh, and we only need about 40 million litres a month for the domestic market. Um, but we're producing between about 100, short of 200 million litres in the quietest month of the year and, and between 1.1 and 1.2 billion litres in the busiest time of the year. So that's our model. It's the New Zealand model. That's what we've embraced. And that's what is well suited, I can talk about it in a minute, to the co-op model. Farmers express their will at the ending of quotas. We want to produce more milk. And because the dairy sector was dominated by co-ops who had to respond to what the members wanted, they just put in place the stainless steel. They, they built the factories and they, and they um, put in place the routes to market and responded to the, the real strength of the co-op model. Next one there, Kerry. So maybe what we could talk about is, you know, why did co-ops stick in some sectors and not in others. Uh, they've been very successful for us in milk. Um, that's just our experience. They just kind of work. And not for any, not because philosophically Irish, Irish people are wonderful cooperators. Um, the opposite is the fact there's a, there's a running joke in Ireland that the, the, the first item on the agenda of the first meeting of any new organization is the split because we're really good at fighting with each other. So it's not that we're natural cooperators. It's just that Milk is just the kind of, it's the kind of product it is. Any individual farmer with 80 cows producing, you know, four or 500,000 litres of milk and the customers in China, well, he's not really going to have, doesn't have the resources to, to go to the market. So they have to collaborate. Supply chains are too long, too complicated, too expensive. So, you know, you, you need scale. So you need to find a way of collaborating with lots of other dairy farmers. And also the milk has to be collected every day or every other day. There isn't time for messing around. So um, you need a long-term relationship with somebody to process, in this in instance, your milk. And so as not to be, you know, um, doubting of whether you're getting screwed or not, you know, if, if, if you own and control that entity, I think you just feel a bit more comfortable. So the model just has been successful for milk. Farmers elect their board and their board decide the milk price and they elect the wrong guys onto the board. Well, that's the price that they pay. So hopefully they elect the, the, the right guys onto the board. So it has stuck in milk and it has been successful in milk right around the world. Um, and particularly for our type of milk, which is an export uh, dominated market. You know, again, 6% of our milk stays at home to be consumed and poured on cornflakes or into coffee. Um, the rest of it has to travel, either travels to the UK for cheese or Germany for butter or the US for butter or China for infant formula. Um, and a co-op is a good model for that. Uh, but there are other sectors where it, it didn't stick. Um, so also, I should have said, they're also dominant in, in grain and agri-trading, but they're the dairy co-ops who, who diversify. Uh, well, there's only one, we have a, 
a reasonable pig process, et cetera, in Ireland, but there's only one co-op involved in that business. And that co-op actually purchased that business because they were big in feed milling. And as anybody who's involved in manufacturing feed to piggeries knows, sometimes you, you can end up owning the piggery. Um, and this co-op ended up owning piggeries and then they owned the big processing plant. I won't say more by accident than by design, but they didn't set out looking to be a pig processor. Uh, lots of other co-ops were in pig processing because traditionally skim milk wasn't dried, it was fed to the pigs, uh, but they all got out of it because they couldn't compete. And we now have no co-op involved in beef or lamb, whereas 20, 20 years ago plus back, all of our almost all of our big co-ops were involved in one way in either beef or lamb processing as well. Uh, and now no co-ops with some tiny specialized exceptions. And we often try to tease it out with farmers, you know, what's so good about the co-op model and what's its strength and what's its weakness. And would you like to be selling your beef uh, to a co-op? And they all say, oh, I would absolutely. I don't want to be selling to these private companies. Then you ask them, well, why aren't you selling to a co-op? They say, well, there aren't any co-ops. Then when you tease out, well, why aren't there co-ops? There were, but they pulled out because it didn't work. Um, why didn't it work? Some people say, oh, the co-ops are too honest. Uh, but to say the co-ops are too honest suggests that somebody else is dishonest and we don't want to be going there. So I think really it's just just weren't cutthroat enough for that particular business. They couldn't be mean enough with their, their members. Uh, whereas a privately owned beef or lamb processor can be as mean as they like, no disrespect to them, but they just have to, they only answer to their to their banker and their God and, um, you know, and that's fine. So our co-ops have failed in, in red meat processing. It is what it is. Uh, and I just don't think certainly in Ireland that they would succeed in the more. Just the nature of the business isn't such that it can compete in that way. Okay, Kerry. So um, what's the big issue facing Irish agriculture and Irish dairy? Just again, this is just to illustrate the nature of co-ops. The big issue facing us, like lots of people, is the environment. Uh, the planet. Uh, for us, it's emissions, greenhouse gases, and ammonia, uh, water quality, so nitrates and phosphates, and biodiversity. Those are the big regulatory frameworks from Europe and at national level that are coming down the tracks, and they're the big challenge to our sector to, to, to comply with it, and we have to, I guess, look at the strengths and weaknesses of the co-op model to address it. Just next, yeah, and just, just a map of Ireland um, showing the areas of concern in terms of waterways and the blue ones are phosphates and the yellow ones are nitrates. So it's, you know, um, and the yellow one ironically is really where most of the milk is kind of is, is in that sort of yellow area. So those are, that's where all the development in milk has been um, in those three yellow areas, those lighter soils that are prone to nitrates leaching and the bluer so soils are, are prone to uh, phosphates. Um, so we do have to deal with those issues, but co-ops, because their co-ops are, have structured themselves quite well to deal with it. Um, they have set up a sustainability, sustainability advisory program, so specialist advisors that they employ or contract to work with farmers, particularly on the water quality side of things. Uh, there's a project which, we've, which has been set up by Chagas, which is the state advisory service called Signpost Farms, which picks 100 farms in the country to be the key influencers, like in social media, uh, they're the influencers on all the technologies that we'll need to adopt to mitigate um, um, greenhouse gas emissions. So Chagas has identified a number of measures that have to be adopted um, for us to mitigate our greenhouse gas emissions. And we're using the signpost farm model with a number of farms in each co-op area. Uh, and those will be the influencers and other farms we visit them and look at the protected ureas and the low emission spreading and all the other measures that will be used to mitigate emissions. Uh, they pay sustainability bonuses for milk, supporting milk recording, and again, promoting protected urea and low emission spreading. So the co-op model, because the co-op answers to its farmers, because it's owned by its farmers, they could, you know, if it, if it was a private business, they could say, well, listen, it's up to the farmer to produce the milk, we just pay them for it. Uh, not in a co-op, you kind of have to support it. So, you know, it, it, it works on that basis for us. Um, question is, will that be enough? I mean, we have a national target uh, in Ireland of a 51% 50, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and agriculture will have to carry its share of the burden. As you know, agriculture has very low mitigation potential. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can do. You can switch your car to electric power, 
what your cow is going to emit or methane, you know, pretty much whatever you do, you can really get small reductions, but, you know, we've got limited mitigation potential. So we are going to have to do our part and certainly the co-ops realize, you know, worst case scenario, we could lose a substantial portion of our dairy herd with huge implications for investment. So that's the biggest project for them at the moment. Okay, Kerry. And in summary, I guess, uh, the co-ops in Ireland, you know, I have to say this, but they have a long and proud tradition. They've been most successful in milk, agri-trade, farm services, spectacularly unsuccessful in red meat. Uh, they certainly weren't an over, overnight success. Things have been, you know, were really tough for, for decades and decades. I, I guess it's been the recent expansion in milk that has allowed them to, I guess, flex, flex their muscles. They've got, and this is an interesting one, co-ops have got best traction where there's been market failure. If any individual entrepreneur, if they could do with themselves, they would do with them themselves. Why would they collaborate with seven other people, potentially seven, seven competitors? Uh, if you could do it yourself, you would. Um, but if you can't do it yourself and you need that bit of scale and you need to collaborate with your direct competition, the co-op model is a great way of doing it. But it really only has succeeded where there has been market failure trying to force cooperation where it's not really necessary or not particularly needed, generally is doomed to failure. People need to have realized that they'll fail doing it, doing it on their own. Then they collaborate. Co-op model is a very good way of doing it. Then generally it works. Uh, but being a co-op itself isn't a, isn't a guarantee of success. You know, just, just having a happy, clappy co-op model whilst I mentioned before, lots of hipsters in Dublin want to set up co-ops to run coffee shops, co-op baristas, because uh, the brand is some sort of kudos. In the real world, the farmers live in, that's not enough. Um, to be successful, you need to have a sound business model. You need to be competitive. You need to be efficient. So that's the prerequisite. As Kerry said in her introduction to me, you know, my number one goal is to try and work with farmers, uh, potential directors, future directors, existing directors to build their skill sets, to be directors of enormously big businesses in very complex environments, dealing with highly motivated um, you know, management teams. Um, and to do that for people who, in our instance, whose day job is milking the cows in the morning, to get to a level where they can be effective directors of enormous companies. You know, it doesn't just happen overnight. It takes a lot of work. But you know, as, as far as we're concerned, the model is potentially very successful and has been in, in the areas where, particularly in dairy and, and, um, and long may be the case, I guess. So thanks for that. Uh, if there's any questions, certainly I'll deal with them. Um, again, we, haven't, we, we have no magic formula, but we've been reasonably successful in limited areas and we're glad to share our experience. Uh, I can hand back to Kerry at this stage. Thanks, Kerry. Thanks very much, TJ. I find that absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for um, sharing so openly um, all of your, I mean, incredible experience and your insight really into what's worked and what hasn't. I think that's invaluable. And just a, a genuine thank you again for giving us your time this evening and joining us. Um, as TJ said, their questions are definitely welcome. Please do use the Q&A function to uh, leave a question and we can put those questions to the panel at the end. I'm now going to pass over to our third speaker of the evening, which is George Noble. Um, George is with us this evening. Um, however, he is so dedicated to spreading the good word of um, the benefits of cooperation that he is joining us from annual leave. So his presentation has been very niftily pre-recorded for this evening so that we hopefully won't experience any technical issues. So before we press play, George, also from SOS, assumes the lead on all things digital and data related. And in particular, he's the lead for the rollout of Smart Rural, a cooperative connectivity business that aims to take a rural first approach to providing the benefits of smart sensor technology and super fast broadband to Scottish agriculture. With a background that includes strategy consulting, 
food processing and economic development, he has spent 10 enjoyable years at SAOS working across co-op and supply chain teams. George led the SAOS delivery of a number of major partnership projects, including the Food and Health Innovation Service, the Rural Innovation Support Service, and a number of knowledge transfer projects, deploying smart sensor technology on family farms. When he's not focusing on disrupting rural connectivity, George can be found riding the waves around the Scottish coast or chasing his kids around the countryside on a bicycle. Good evening and thanks Kerry for the introduction. In preparing the content for tonight's presentation, I took some time to sit back and reflect on the journey that I've been on over the past few years within SOS, which has evolved from a more traditional supply chain consulting and innovation support role the one where I've been thrust into the high-tech world of sensors, data, and new cooperative structures via my involvement in Smart Rural, and also through helping our member co-ops take the first tentative steps on their data journey. And in doing so, I've tried to distill some of the lessons I've learned along the way and share some of what I see as a bright future for co-ops in creating ever more value in what is an increasingly digital future. As the audience will be acutely aware, with a long and rich history in Scotland of producing fantastic food and drink products, many of which are the envy of the rest of the world and have been critical in defining ourselves as the land of food and drink. And in spite of this, our industry, industry is facing what I would say is a generationally unique set of pressures that we can't afford to ignore and where business as usual is not an option. And I think we're gonna be challenged like never before to shape our industry into one that's profitable, sustainable, resilient, and significantly, I think we're going to have to provide real data um, in a way that we've never had to before to satisfy government that our industry is meeting its climate change commitments, to refute erroneous claims of the climate impact of our industry, to demonstrate provenance and supply chain integrity to a degree that we've never had to before to protect existing trading relationships and foster new ones by adding value through information. And if we're gonna maintain our position in the world, we're gonna to have to capture and manage, our, manage data at a scale and in a manner to which we've not been accustomed to in the past. And I firmly believe that cooperatives and cooperative models would be pivotal in underpinning and enabling this transition. So let's start by having a look at how co-op models are already being used here in Scotland to bring about demonstrable improvements in our food and drink industry through the smart use of data before moving on to look at some global examples. So a very practical example of how cooperative management of data has delivered value is in Scott EID, which is Scotland's national livestock trace system. Unlike livestock traceability systems in other parts of the world, which are tightly government controlled, Scott AID operates on cooperative principles and is in effect a public-private partnership between government and industry, where movement data is cooperatively managed by Scott AID on behalf of the entire livestock sector. This innovative approach has allowed us to develop a livestock trace system that is revered across the world and has led to a dramatic increase in Scotland's ability to not only monitor but to manage potential disease outbreaks. The industry-owned core data that is held within Scott EID is now being used to forge partnerships in ways that are adding value to the sector, including the ability to verify sc Scotch beef as having been born, reared, and butchered within Scotland, to provide the data and tools to support BVD eradication, as well as a number of new and evolving ways in which the industry can benefit from their own data. And perhaps the most potent example of where Scott EID's approach to the management of data has positively impacted industry lies in the success of the BVD eradication scheme, where the use of core data augmented by BVD testing has all but eradicated BVD within Scotland. And successful eradication of BVD has had a clear and direct impact on production efficiency, meaning that improvements in financial performance and a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions has resulted. The second example of how cooperative use of data can add value to the sector is through the work that I'm involved with at Smart Rural, 
where we're aiming to deploy a Scotland-wide Internet of Things network and facilitate the deployment of smart sensors that will allow us to capture data from farms and use that data to help develop solutions to the challenges that I've already outlined. Where we differ from other agritech solutions providers is that the data we'll collect will be managed cooperatively for the benefit of the industry. In terms of progress thus far, we already have four live demonstration farms across Scotland with sensors deployed, and we'll soon have blanket network coverage across a good chunk of rural Angus, at which point we'll move out of pre-commercial phase and formally launch. And this slide provides a bit more detail on the practicality of what we're doing at Smart Rural. So firstly, looking at the left of the slide, we are seeking to deploy smart sensor devices that collect data and support a number of key use cases that help farmers, their advisors, their co-ops and the wider industry make better decisions. Uh, and to do that, we use a radio technology called LoRaWAN, which is a very low power network that can operate over long ranges and connect thousands of sensors. And many of these can operate for years, sometimes up to 10 on standard AA batteries, meaning they're essentially fit and forget, which makes them ideal for use in a rural environment. The data is then presented to the farmer, the advisors, and even existing co-ops via online dashboards where visual displays, graphs, and alerts can help inform farm, inform farm activity and help support the farmer in decision-making. A wide variety of sensors and solutions are available, allowing monitoring of everything from grain pile temperatures right through to level alerts within silage effluent tanks and much, much more. And the sensor data will be stored, aggregated uh, within a data co-op structure that we're in the process of establishing. And the ultimate use of which will be determined by the members themselves. But this might include analytics of aggregated data sets and combination with other data sources, which will allow us to drive insights that can be fed back to industry as value. It could be about sharing uh, data with government to help support policy development and potentially the distribution of farm payments. We can share data with the research community and of course provide data to key supply chains to help support the farming sector either by locking them into existing relationships uh, or developing new existing, developing new relationships, sorry, and adding potentially new value through information. I've included here a few examples of how sensor source data might be used on farm and beyond in new and innovative ways to help support our sector. So looking, for example, at weather data, we see big opportunities for aggregated data collected from infield weather stations. And this might include supporting enhanced disease risk modeling prediction, so that could be for blight, improving flood responses, facilitating the development of new insurance products to be made available to our sector, reducing environmental impact due to improved timing of fertilizer and chemical applications, and an improved understanding of weather conditions and how it impacts livestock and crop performance. And advances in sensor technology also means that we can now capture a whole host of biodiversity data, which will become of increasing importance as we move towards an agri-policy landscape that will focus heavily on being rewarded for the custodianship of public goods. So being able to quantify biodiversity improvements at a farm and industry level through sensor technology could have a significant impact and will open up opportunities for innovation such as triggering farm payments or offering up new supply chain opportunities. And looking at location data, you know, individualized tracking of livestock and green space will not only help with enhanced livestock traceability, but the data can also be used to underpin marketing messages such as grass fed or pasture raised, which mean very little at the present time, but with tangible data to back up, um, some of these claims could you know, form quite a powerful marketing message for the industry. And finally, with full fuel use and energy consumption being key areas identified where farms can reduce their carbon footprint, we can use smart sensor technology to capture data that can provide a more accurate baseline and support future reductions. And this is really only scratching the surface 
And I'm confident that the value and use of data sets will increase over time as the volume of data that uh, we collect increases. And when we are in the process of conceptualizing the cooperative data structures that would underpin smart rural, we look near and far for examples of aggregated co-ops that we could learn from. And in doing so, we soon discovered that beyond some interesting models proposed in the academic literature, there were actually very few real life examples. And rather than scare us, this made us realize that we are really at the forefront of developing new and exciting propositions that could add long-term value to the Scottish industry. And we were also fortunate fortunate enough to get a chance to talk to some of those co-ops that were already active in this space. And I'll share, share a few examples of some of those here. So our first example is a data cooperative from the USA called Growers Information Services Cooperative, or JISC for short. Uh, this is spearheaded by a chap called Billy Tiller, who we, the, we had the pleasure of hosting our SOS conference in 2020. So principally, an arable co-op just seeks to firstly provide its members with a secure private data repository that can be used to capture, collect, store, and organize all information relative to a member's farming operations. Secondly, they also look to extract value from data being collected um, through their JISC platform, which provides analysis and insights to members and allows them to share information back and forth with each other, the stakeholders, and with other authenticated third parties. And finally, they also aim to provide good governance around about farm data. And of course, as a cooperative, JISC is owned by its members and is governed by a board of directors elected by those members. And that JISC board determines the data sharing agreements and under which circumstances data might be used. And this is similar to the proposed solution for Smart Rural. And one example of how they're adding value to member data is through benchmarking of yields against validated data sets from across the USA. And this allows individual farmers to see how they're performing against those with similar varieties, geographic location, soil types, or a host of other parameters. And our next example is a Dutch farmer cooperative called Joint Data. And this was developed on the back of a concern that in an increasingly digital world, farmers were not in the driving seat when it came to control and access to their own data, oftentimes losing track of who they granted access to over time. And their approach was to try and take back control of data access and to place it in the hands of farmers so that they're in the driving seat when it comes to agri-tech companies um, accessing their data, deciding when and where they can use it. And the pl platform provides a really simple means by which the farmer can grant or revoke access when he or she decides to do so. And I'll just share a short video here that illustrates um, how joint data works. Look, there's Peter. And this is his farm. Together with his wife, he runs a dairy farm. The use of technology makes Peter's work very efficient. Besides milk, Peter's company also produces lots of data. He monitors all kinds of information about his cattle, such as the yield, their health, and where they are. However, the machines and sensors Peter uses are delivered and controlled by separate suppliers. Because of this, it's becoming very difficult to combine data and to create new actionable insights. To manage his company, Peter even has to log in to different types of applications. Frustrating, especially when you forget your password. Peter shares his data upon request from his suppliers and his dairy company. He has authorized a lot of parties, but can't see the forest for its trees anymore. After the most recent request, he asks himself, who has access to my data? For what purpose do they use it? And what do I get out of this? Join Data is a nonprofit cooperative founded to give all farmers control over their data. And because application providers are connected to join data, you can access your applications with just one password. Data from separate suppliers can easily be shared with application providers. This way, Peter gains actionable insights and is able to make smarter decisions. Do you want to be in control of your data? Then join data.
So that's been a very quick overview of how cooperative use of data might help our food and farming industries prepare themselves for what is going to be a future that's characterized by change. So for me, some of the key takeaways to consider are, you know, firstly, farmers don't want to be data managers. And in this respect, we need to endeavor to simplify the collection, interpretation, presentation, analysis, and governance of data. Simply put, we should be aiming to make life simpler. And co-ops have a history of excelling in doing this. Secondly, agricultural co-ops are more relevant than ever. And I firmly believe that they can actually be the locus of value creation in the digital era and help address some of the major challenges that our industry faces. But to do so, they need to view member data as an asset and view this through the lens of being able to provide new value-added opportunities. This will inevitably require new skills and I think co-ops need to start thinking seriously about this now and beginning on the journey. And I think an important point to underscore is that technology itself will not replace personal relationships. Your know, co-ops bring people together and do great things, and we should not seek to try and replace this, but rather to use technology to augment all the good stuff that we're doing at the moment within our agricultural cooperatives. And finally, I believe we'll all see, see the formation of new agricultural co-ops, the express purpose of which will be to enable value to be created from non-physical farm assets, so from the farm data itself. So I hope that you found that interesting and that's all from me for tonight. And I look forward to joining you in the Q&A session where I'm happy to take any questions. George, I, I, uh, I hope you're still with us. That was uh, great and a really, um, quick and concise look at some of the um, benefits of data. Thank you very much for uh, supplying that and hopefully um, we'll be able to speak to you in the Q&A. Tonight's webinar, all of the um, slides, the resources, the links and speaker details will all be available on the Farm Advisory Scotland website. That's www.fast.scot. Um, they, they won't be up immediately, but they should be up within about a week. So uh, with the slides finished for the evening, we are going to go to the panel for our Q&A. Um, the Q&A is still open for a few more minutes. So as we're speaking, if you'd like to submit any questions, please do feel free to do so. Um, I'm going to put the first question to Robert, if I may. Robert, once you've answered, we may uh, check in with the rest of the panel to see if their opinion is the same as yours. So a uh, question here, do you think that the opportunity for co-ops has passed? Is there still room when big corporates are so big? Mighty first question. Um, well, I mean, first up, we, to, if, we, if we step back a bit, we, we should remember that the co-ops that we do have in Scotland are, are well, world-leading co-ops that we do have. There's, and, that, and members represent 50% of Scottish pigs. Um, it's about 125,000 tonnes of, of potatoes, 25% of malt barley, 50% of oats, 50% of oilseed rape, already within... Um, within a co-op structure and so on beyond. Um, but I don't think we need to look far and, and there will be plenty within um, the dairy uh, processing um, and, and um, poultry and pig sector who, who will vouch for, for us testify to this and unfortunately most recently within the green sector to see that the, the um, diminishing uh, amount of choice that we have um, is an increasing problem. Um, and we don't we don't have that level of competition in some areas, um, which means actually, despite us being really efficient at farm level, we're having to transport um, pro products or you know, livestock even further afield, and and that and that cost has been borne back onto producers um, to if, 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 that's, if that's to work. So there's got to be a, at some point there's got to be a, a you know a point in time where we where we need to grasp that nettle and. Um, it's not that the um, producers are not efficient, but actually the whole structure needs to be there in order to add that value and then drive that value back down onto farm. Um, so there's a gap there just now for sure, um, and, and it's something that does need to be addressed. 
Great answer to a very big question, Robert. Um, <laughs> TJ, do you, do you agree with Robert? Do you think that there is still room when big corporates are so big? I think there is, absolutely. But I mean, as I said before, it's the co-op still has to be a really well-run business. Um, the only difference, the only difference there can be is a democratic structure. It, it, you know, you can't have passengers in in the in the co-op model. It can't be an excuse for mediocrity. It can't be an excuse for going at the speed of the slowest person in the group. So they have to be really well run, really efficient businesses. But if they are, and the business model is sound, then the democratic element can be a really good um, additional bolt on where people feel actually. In the long run, I'm better off doing business with this entity that I own a piece of uh, and that I have a say in the governance of. The, the business fundamentals have to be sound. And then if the members appreciate and put value on democratic control, then I think you hit the sweet spot. Um, but we've had enough failures in Ireland to know that if any of the bits are wrong, then you just won't compete with you know a highly motivated um business owner running their own business, um, they'll probably beat you every time uh, if that's the only criterion is you know, Uber efficiency. So, um, but there is certainly great potential for co-ops and we're certainly keen to spread them into sectors that we haven't been successful in thus far. PJ, you, you mentioned the success that you've had in Ireland with dairy specifically. We've had a, a question here about dairy co-ops in Ireland. So a few years back, a lot of the dairy co-ops converted to PLCs. Whatever happened to them? Yeah, I guess about a half a dozen in the 80s um, after milk quotas were introduced and, and they had been expanding dramatically in the 70s and then milk quotas were introduced and their options for developing their businesses um, dried up. So they looked at other businesses and um, to fund those businesses, they looked at incorporation as, as public companies. So five or six, depending on how we account them, converted to PLCs, but they've all ultimately sort of got out of milk. Um, two of them um, merged into another PLC, Glanbia. So Evan Moore and Waterford PLC merged into Glanbia PLC. And, uh, but the co-op, the Glanbia co-op, which was always the largest shareholder in the PLC, has it's re-established itself and has taken up, taken control now of the milk business. So the PLC recognised and PLC shareholders recognise that actually milk, milk processing isn't a great business to be in. So the co-op has reasserted itself. Uh, Donegal Creamery's PLC got out of milk and sold its business to an existing co-op. Uh, Golden Vale PLC was taken out by Kerry PLC and that's en route, I think, to going back into co-op, majority co-op ownership as well. So PLCs, whilst they were attractive for a while and they allowed people to guess um, an uplift in, in the value of their shares, which is the key difference between a public company and a co-op. Um, ultimately, you know, agriculture isn't a really a great business for a PLC to be in because it's a low margin business. So they, they've backed out of the business, I guess, and, and it, co-ops have reasserted themselves and re-established control of the sector. Fantastic answer. Thank you very much for that, TJ. Um, we've got one here for George. Can I just check, George, can you hear us? I can hear you. Yeah, I'm still here. Fantastic. So a uh, question for George. Why are there so few agricultural data co-ops globally? Um, I think it's just such a new model that um, even in a global scale, people haven't quite crossed the nettle yet. It's just quite literal, literally too new. And it's really interesting when we're beginning to think about the data cooperative structure for smart rural. And we looked at some of these global examples, quite literally, we could only find two, maybe three, um, some that were being talked about, lots that were just still academic thoughts. So for me, it's really... Um, just too early, I think we're just at the tip of the spear here. And, uh, you know, I think what we are doing here is, is, is kind of breaking new ground in some ways. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a really exciting place to be in because quite literally there's not a lot out there. Um, another follow up question for you, George, while we still have you. Um, this is you have answered this in openly in the Q&A, but just in case any of our attendees haven't yet had a chance to have a look at the Q&A. Who owns the aggr aggregated data? I see you have data sales as part of Smart Rural. 
Yeah, I mean, when we were thinking about the the, the co-op model that underpinned the the, the the data ownership piece, yeah, it, it's it's the part of smart rural that we're kind of still evolving, if you will. And I did have a couple of thoughts about you know putting data sales within the slides because it can touch a nerve. But ultimately, if the decision to sell data or do whatever the the farmers decide to do with it ultimately lies with the farmers themselves, then, you know, it, it's ultimately their decision to make if they're gonna sell the data and benefit from it because far better that those who generate the data make decisions about to actually benefit from the, the sale of that data than some large agri-tech company. Great answer, thank you, George. Um, there was a question that TJ answered in the Q&A about um, government support for co-ops in Ireland. So I wonder, um, TJ, if you could just clarify that again for, for the recording, um, what government support do co-ops receive in Ireland? Yeah, they don't receive any support uh, specific to being co-ops, um, just like any other company, they're entitled to you know, apply for grant aid and any other funding that's available. So nothing specific or nothing by virtue of being co-ops, it's just normal supports to enterprise. Um, um, Robert, can I pose the same question in the Scottish context? Is that the same for us in Scotland? Do we have a different landscape? Right, no, unfortunately, unfortunately not. No, the same is true. It's a business model like, like uh, any other, so it's got access to the same opportunities. Thank you very much. Um, a nice question here about the members of a co-op, arguably the most important part of the co-op, the people within it. So how important is it for a co-op to have very engaged and loyal members? Could members not just trade with the co-op without getting involved with the politics or the structure of it? Um, who would like to take this one first? TJ? Yeah, thanks, Kerry. Um... Yeah, I mean, a, a member can just coast along and be happy enough that, that, that the co-op just happens to be their their business partner. Um, but if everybody did that, who'd make the decisions, who'd sit on the board? So yeah, it is very important that, that members, at least a good number of them, um, get engaged, get involved, maybe get elected, go to the meetings, ask the tough questions, um, give the board a bit of a rollicking occasionally if they're, you know, if they're not performing. That, that's really important because it keeps the business efficient. So really, you know, some people can sit back, but really the business is better for people being engaged and being involved and searching their you know, autonomy and, 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 uh, and control that they have. Absolutely. Robert, anything to add to that answer? Uh, no, not really. A, a, level, that, that, a strong level of engagement makes sure it was, it was a two-way conversation. Uh, it keeps it keeps management uh, of of the co-op on their toes and make sure they know why why they're there uh, to deliver value back to members. But equally, it allows it allows management to be able to um, a, put point across of, of, of the of the trade landscape they're in and understand why things have been done the way they've been doing. Um, and it, so it keeps that conversation going. Everybody's everybody's on the one page. So that that level of engagement is really important. Yeah. So we've just got two more questions this evening, um, a specific one for George, and then I'll round off with a, an open question to the three of you. So George, initially, how can smart sensor technologies and cooperative data be used to support climate change mitigation and protection of biodiversity within agriculture? I mean, I think for me, one of the, the most exciting areas is we're seeing the development of these really low powered sensors really accelerating at um, a huge pace and scale at the moment. So we're seeing, for example, you know, um, the ability to embed machine learning models into tiny, tiny sensors that can operate in batteries for a number of years. And what this means, it's actually that, you know, you can, you don't need to shuttle huge amounts of data to the cloud over the internet to do the processing. It's all done in devices. So what we're seeing actually, um, you know, quite a lot of advances in the field of natural capital. So um, a couple of devices that are just coming over the horizon. We've got um, sensors, the acoustic sensors that sit in the field and will listen for and detect the numbers of pollinators uh, within any given field. So you just quite literally stick this battery, so battery powered sensor in the field and it'll tell you how much pollinators they are and it can track that over time. 
And similarly, we're seeing acoustic devices that can, you know, you could stick it in a hedgerow and it will detect the number and type of birds um, that um, are in that hedgerow. So again, thinking about where we're going in terms of farm policy, some of these sensors might offer a real opportunity to take some of the burden and complexity out of the, I suppose, the inspection process moving forward and even potentially help uh, inform a future payments regime. Thank you very much, George. Um, we do, we have a hand up in the participants audience. Um, I wonder if our producer, could you um, allow Brian Henderson to share audio with us? Brian, can you hear us? Well, I'm just waiting for that to get set up. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back, we'll have a couple of extra questions just to see if um, we had an extra hand up in the audience there. So before we get there, um, we've got a question in the Q&A at the moment. It's directed to Robert. Um, do we know what the size of the untapped opportunity for more Scottish co-ops to create their own brands and to connect with the consumer is? Just, um, you've caught me, you've caught me. I was uh, typing the response there just now to Helen. So no, thank you for, for that, Kerry, and, and to Helen for the question. Um, it knows the short answer, but I, I probably should um, step back from some of the examples I gave, the worldwide examples I gave um, that were presented um, earlier on. They were all at big scale, but just to say that that doesn't need to be the case. And a, a sound producer co-op that's functioning properly and functioning well, and 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 there is an ambition within that cooperative to to explore other avenues. You know, you can develop a brand idea and build on that from a really small scale. See how it works, um, and then you know that the core business is sitting there at the back of that. That's sound, and it gives, you know, it's given that flexibility to explore it and uh, and, and develop and see what it, see where it takes you from there. Um, so, I mean, like any, any of these uh, co-ops I mentioned, they didn't start where they are now. Um, so just like, it, like any business, you, 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 your product development uh, arm and, and, and you just you build from there. It's good. Great, great answer, Robert. Thank you very much for that. I think it's um, key, isn't it, really, that that kind of the, the brand development is all about speaking to the, the heart of the people that are involved in it and that engage with it. Um, Brian, I believe that um, the version of Zoom that you're using means that you can't actually speak to us this evening, I'm afraid. So please do, um, if you would like to speak to us, you can send me a chat message directly or you can pop it in the Q&A. Um, so we'll, we'll give you a couple more minutes just to see if anything else comes through just before we get there. So this is one for um, the full panel. So. Um, Nice quick answers. We'll go to TJ first, then George, then Robert. So what is your advice on how a co-op can maximise member engagement, particularly for long-standing co-ops? TJ. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and this is really a developing area. I mean, the traditional model was, you know, meetings, regional meetings and newsletters and all the old traditional ways of doing business. But COVID being the ultimate disruptor has you know none of us could have had physical meetings over the last period so now I guess it's about looking at new technologies and bloody zoom calls and 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 what else and social media what what do the people want one of the biggest challenges we have is as dairy is growing so fast we've an awful lot of new entrants and young people people who've come back into dairy who had gone off and been professionals in other jobs around the world and come back to the home farm and started milking cows and those people are sort of um removed from the traditional way of doing things and they're not really interested in going to long meetings and leave and listen to old fellas talking and rattling on the way they used to so they want a new way of engaging and we're sort of struggling but we're sort of getting there trying to figure out new ways of engaging with these people and there is a bit more social media there's a bit you know but um you know a bit, a bit more i suppose electronic ways of talking to them because their time is a lot more valuable maybe than the previous generation so we're learning, um, we're learning slowly, but COVID probably has pushed us a little a few steps along the road. I don't think you're alone in that, TJ. Um, George, 
anything you would like to add there? Any advice for um, long standing co ops on increasing member engagement? I mean, I do tend to agree with uh, most of the points that TJ has made. I think that, you know, COVID has moved us into a new space, albeit I'm sure everybody's completely zoomed out. So I think it's taken a bit of a blended approach. So um, recognising there's kind of core, um, you know, co-op membership there that are going to still want the traditional, you know, newsletter printed out and sent to them. Weekly, you're going to want to try and engage and innovate to bring, uh, you know, younger uh and maybe more diverse, um, you know, uh, directors on board a co-op, and I think we've got to kind of think of the innovative ways we can we can can do that whilst not disenfranchising those that have made a valued contribution to the co-ops over the years. So I think it it can be tricky in places, but I think you know, again, as TJ says, you know, COVID's maybe moved us along um, that curve a wee bit. Absolutely, George. Thank you very much, and Robert. Yeah, um, a, a tremendous question, and it's, it's one that we're always wrestling with. And only to add a couple of points that I've written down here is that um, making sure the staff and the boards are fully aware of what the co op is about and what it's trying to achieve, because uh, they should be your ambassadors, they should be your amplifier. Um, so, you've got the traditional uh, forms of communication, and we're, we're, we're wrestling with some of the newer forums as well, but the, the board. Um, and and you know what what they're, they're talking to members and each of them are working, talking to five members and they're talking to another five you know you amplify out like that. Um, the other one that we're doing a bit with just now is the member value statements, and 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 just working with that over time to see what resonates. Um, looking at well what 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 value has been delivered by the co-op on behalf of the membership. Um, and, and it's not necessarily all financial value, but what, what goods it do, it might be making life easier, it might be minimising risk, it might be providing another service um, that um, you know, effect, effectively it's non-profit. Um, and, and it's these things, and how do you can condense that down into some sort of form of communication, a member value statement or something, and then you can put that out to, to the membership as, as well. Just trying to find different ways to, to uh, connect with, with, with folks that have got a limited amount of time um, to, to, to you've, you've not got much access to them, so you need to be quite, quite um, selective. Not an easy task at all, Robert. Um, I'm going to round up this evening with a, a final question for all three of you. If you could tell our at attendees the one thing that excites you the most about the future of cooperation and collaboration, what would it be? George, would you like to take this one first? Yeah, absolutely, Kerry. I mean, I think for me, it's actually the power of data. I think it's the power of being able to unlock value from some of the intangible things, some of the things that were maybe not um, thought about in the past, things that are maybe non-traditional. But if we're able to, you know, uh, aggregate, uh, derive insights, you know, attribute value to some of those things, then I think that's going to be a real source of value for co-ops moving forward. So, I mean, as a, a really trite example, you know, it, it might be as simple as, you know, sticking GPS trackers on cows that show how much time they've spent a grass and doing a self-certified, um, you know, uh, grass-fed label. Something as, as simple as that, but maybe just trying to think more broadly how we can use data to add value. Great answer, George. Thank you very much. Robert? Yeah, well, I've been with SEOS now for about two, two years, and I've been you know, super impressed with the level of ambition that's shown, the level of efficiency, the focus on efficiency that, uh, and the leanness that's within the co-ops in order to drive that benefit back down to, to farm level. And, and so there's a core activity, and, and, and that will remain. Um, but, and I suppose from my own point of view, I suppose I'm pretty excited about extending on, on George's point about some of these additional areas where where co-ops may be able to to support farmers and, and again it's about knowledge transfer and exchange about risk management a, about data and environment natural capital a, and because there's, there's a lot of information having to be, be be presented for customers the pressures coming from from customers a, to to address the climate angle and and a, you know a sustainability development goals that type of thing over and above providing the raw commodity 
um, as, as much as it's coming from um, policymakers and government themselves. So there's, all, there's, there's an extra dimension that's starting to, to appear within co-ops and they've got to try and wrestle with that. So, you know, being there to support that is uh, pretty exciting times. Fantastic. Thank you, Robert. And TJ, for you, what is, what's the thing that excites you most about the future of co-ops? That's a tough one, but I guess it's actually the customer, the consumer, uh, and I think what's a change in consumer sentiment where they're more interested in where their product comes from, particularly where foods come from, and they're all interested, they're interested in the sustainability potentials, um, and it's not just environmental sustainability, which is hugely important, but there's the social and there's the economic sustainability as well, and just the co-op model has such a fantastic story to tell if we can if we can do it right and, and communicate directly to consumers that actually this is a product that comes from an entity which is a democratic structure where all the members have an equal say, where all the members are committed, that's committed to serving the members rather than you know a company that's driven by you know solely a profit imperative. But I think if you can communicate that message properly and package it properly, I think there's just the, the potential support that's out there amongst our consumers uh, is enormous. And I think that's one of the most exciting challenges. Well, TJ, I think that you, Robert and George, have done a fantastic job of doing some of that communication this evening. So thank you very much for sharing all of that with us. Um, this webinar, along with the previous two, the benefits of cooperation and collaboration, and the second webinar that we recorded, which is different types of cooperation and collaboration, all three webinars will be available to watch back and download from the Farm Advisory Service website. And in September, October, the Farm Advisory Service will be releasing a special one-off edition podcast with some very special guests discussing all about the future opportunities of co-ops and collaborations. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night.